why it matters what we believe about creation. The, uh, there are a lot of interesting developments in the Christian church, interesting and part um, partially, perhaps. It's, yeah. it's either all or none. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, there are a lot of interesting things and uh, some challenging things happening in the Christian church these days. And we're going to talk about that today. There are choices that, that we make, that Christians make. Which is more like, more like what really has happened? <coughs> are we improving? Are we going the other direction? Focusing on the, the Super Bowl with some beer cans and um, which direction is man going? And looking at it a little more specifically, choices are where did we come from? <coughs> Uh, to many people, this is a kind of a naive idea, Adam and Eve, but uh, we choose uh, that picture of origins or, or this one with life evolving uh, over time. And <coughs> the, the important thing about this choice is what is it based on? Um, one is based on the Bible, the idea that God actually did inspire the Bible and he knows uh, what he's talking about, or we base it on on uh, contemporary science, the the theory of evolution, <coughs> which knows more about what's going on. And for Christians, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, we have uh, the Bible is here, but it takes a secondary place. It, it's science is the standard. And we bring in the Bible, uh, you know, as we can. And so um, those are um, literal creation, on one hand. God really did create life in a seven-day week uh, a few thousand years ago. Or he used evolution as his means of creating over many millions of years. And that's a choice that uh, is being made today. And the choices that people are, the Christians are making are changing. Uh, really quite rapidly. The number that are going this way is getting smaller. The number that are going this way is uh, getting very large. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the percentages would be of the people sitting in the churches. But the scholarly Christian, Christian community is just going rapidly in this direction. Um, I've given some talks at uh, meetings, the uh, uh, some meetings, a, a conference for a college and university teachers given by Campus Crusade for Christ. And so I gave a talk on my ideas about how to uh, use the Bible to help us to get clues for geology research. And, you know, they weren't interested. Um, that was just, it wasn't what they were looking for. I gave a similar type of talk at um, the uh, uh, Lewis Conference. Um, let's see, uh, in, in England, what has he called it? O Oxbridge Conferences. C.S. Uh, Lewis, and you know they're 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 not interested. They're going this direction. Um, I'm acquainted with the geology professors at Wheaton College, which is supposed to be a fairly conservative Christian college. They're not friendly to people who who take this position that, that this is actually true, and so it goes. So the the Christian world is changing really very rapidly. <coughs> I understand that. The major Christian publishers uh, in recent years are not publishing any books dealing with creation. That's no longer an interesting subject uh, in the Christian world. So <clears throat> why, do, why do we care whether creation is true? Let's talk about that first before we talk about any, any science. And some reasons to care is that the Bible is our foundation. Um, and it isn't a matter of uh, just Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11. I've, I've heard it said, well, you know, the Bible is fine, you, you just Genesis 1 through 11 is a problem. Well, no, that's really not quite right because uh, the literal creation and flood and all these things are, are affirmed throughout the Bible, <coughs> starting um, you know, in Exodus and going all the way down, of course, into Revelation. There are many texts. Jesus himself obviously believed that these things are real. There really was a Jonah and a Noah, 
um, and Adam and Eve. <coughs> and let's talk about the Old Testament, <coughs> the relationship of Jesus to the Old Testament. I, I've heard a Seventh-day Adventist theologian say that, yes, Jesus obviously believed in the literal creation, but then Jesus was a first century man. He didn't know any better. The, the creator of the universe didn't know any better. Um, think about Jesus' mission on this earth. He came down here to, to live as we do and, to, and demonstrate that Satan is wrong. Um, he came down here to, to live his life and accomplish his mission. He could not have any advantage over us. He could not have his, his divine knowledge that he had in heaven. He had to live like we do. Okay, so you got Jesus coming down as a baby, facing the devil with thousands of years of experience in tricking us. How could Jesus be successful, even if he was God? He could not have an advantage over us. From human point of view, it's impossible. But what did he do? He gave himself a very big advantage. But it's an advantage that we have exactly the same way if we'll take advantage of it. He, in, he inspired his servants to write the book that he knew he would be reading when he came down here. He wrote his own textbook. And it had to be true. It had to be factual and reliable uh, to give him the information. He knew who God, he knew who he was. He knew who the devil was. He knew all about the controversy and about creation. Um, that's, of course, a very important reason why he was successful. <coughs> and think about the effect of our belief in creation, the effect that it has on other doctrines. Uh, these God of love, who is all-powerful, redemption, heaven and, and the new earth, uh, it has, has effects on all of these uh, doctrines. <coughs> Let's uh, begin here with... Um, some, some implications, if the literal creation and fall and the global flood are not true, what are some implications? Okay, look at the fourth commandment. For six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, God wrote this with his finger in stone. And he said, in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth, the sea and all that is in them. Okay, is that true? <coughs> If what he wrote with his finger in stone is not true, what does that mean? To me, it mean, uh, one thing I can always conclude, if this isn't true, the con great controversy is all over, and dev the devil's got God by the throat because he lied to us. Okay, so the implications, if these are not true, then God lied. <coughs> How about the rainbow promise after the flood? The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. That's God's promise. Okay, the, 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 the global flood is described by a particular word, the mabul, which is different from what local floods are described, how they are described. So there's something special here. If, if the flood was a local event, then every time we've had a flood, um, you know, God has lied. He, he lied to us. If, um, if the Genesis is not true, then he lied in each of these cases. And I don't believe that God lies. If, uh, if the creation story is not true, then there really is no basis for the Sabbath. And it isn't that we need to protect the Sabbath. You know, if the Sabbath was, is not really true, well, why protect it? But it's a, the Sabbath is a reminder that these, in fact, are true. And so that's why it is important. But there's really no basis for it if, um, if life evolved over millions of years. <coughs> Why do we worship God? Why, why does he have a right to ask for our worship? It tells us that in, 11, in Revelation 4.11. He can re ask for our worship because he created us. He, he, we are his. He created us. And thus he has the right to ask for our worship. Um, sure, he redeemed us. We value that. But he would, why does he have a right to redeem us? Because we are his. He created us. It all comes back to the creation as the foundation. <coughs> And you know, there, there's, uh, I've read quite a few of the writings of theistic evolutionists, some of, some of whom are thought to be the, the eminent writers on this topic. They have PhDs in science and in theology. And it's interesting to see what they say about these issues. 
they of course all base their their whole theology on their conviction that evolution is true. That's the way life came about. And so, but they try to bring God in, in, in a theistic evolution point of view. But they're quite frank about Jesus' death. Because believing that life has evolved, they recognize that the evil in the world uh, in that scenario does not come from man's sin. Uh, it's a part of God's plan. And so they recognize, that, well, Jesus didn't die for our sins because evil didn't, was not the result of sin. Jesus may have died for some other reason, to show his, his uh, solidarity with us. Uh, <clears throat> so the whole, the whole issue of salvation comes into question here. And if creation is not true, what about redemption and heaven? And it's interesting what these authors have to say. I mean, they, they try to hang on to heaven but if God didn't get it right the first time, why would we think he's going to get it right the second time? So um, somehow it doesn't all fit together if we, if we say that God is <coughs> used evolution. The origin of evil is a very big one. Um, Darwin struggled with this, especially after the death of his favorite daughter. Evil in the world, how do we explain it? How can we, uh, if there's a good God, how can there be evil? So the question of God's character and the origin of evil is a very big question. This poor cow made a bad mistake, tried to cross a cattle guard. I watched his progress for several years. Um, there's a lot of evil in the world. I, I reminded of it every time, uh, time I see a dead cat on the road or a dog or anything. Um, I'm going to tell you a parable. <coughs> a parable is a story that has a deeper meaning. Um, the, a man likes dogs. He wants to raise lots of dogs. And I can understand that, how much he likes dogs. He has a problem to deal with. There's this wolf that lives in the neighborhood. And it's not your ordinary wolf. He's very mean and nasty, and he will kill all those dogs. And the man knows that. So how is he going to deal with that? There'll be all kinds of suffering and agony and death. What to do about it? So he decides, all right, I'll raise lots of puppies. Most of them will get slaughtered by the wolf. But if the strongest ones will survive, and I'll have a few dogs. There's another man who wants to raise dogs. <coughs> and um, he loves dogs. He just wants dogs. And, but he has the same wolf to deal with. So what's he going to do? Well, he is a little different frame of mind. He really does love his dogs, and he's a little smarter. He makes a big fence around his property, and he teaches the dogs to stay in the fence. But then one day, he looks out, and he sees a little dog has gone out of the fence, and he's heading out for the woods. The little dog is going. The wolf is coming. The man could say, well, you dumb dog. I told you to stay in the fence. Uh, we might be inclined to do that sometimes. But he's a different kind of person. He, he runs out and leaps between the dog and the wolf. He takes a terrible beating from the wolf, but he saves his dog. <coughs> okay, what does the parable mean? There's a story I like to stick in here. Uh, I, have a, I have a niece, I mean a nephew, who I think is a, is a genuine hero. Um, he has three younger sisters and a younger brother. And one day the four of them were out playing in the backyard and their mother was on the other side of the yard working in the garden. And a neighbor had a mean dog, and that dog that day got out of his fence, and he came and he jumped over their fence, and he headed for one of the girls. Well, Darren, the 11-year-old, instinctively jumped between the dog and his sister. He took some nasty bites on his, on his shoulder and his arm, uh, but he saved his sister. Jesus, of course, did the same thing, and he took thousands of times more of beating uh, than, than Darren did. So what does the parable mean? <coughs> This story here uh, represents the situation where God creates Adam and Eve. The earth is good. Everything is good, and there is no evil. Adam and Eve sin. Then there comes evil, pain, and death because of their sin. Jesus accepts torture and death, and he saves us uh, from the evil, <coughs> ultimately. And this is the integrated Christian worldview. God is not responsible for evil. Sin is responsible for evil. The other story, 
represents the scenario where God creates by allowing evil to evolve. Most of these dogs will get slaughtered. Evolution works by survival of the fittest. Evolution depends on death, lots of death. Otherwise, you cannot have natural selection functioning. Uh, so this is the process. If life comes about by evolution, pain, suffering, and death. And if, if God used evolution as his means of creation, this is part of God's plan. That's why it matters. <coughs> this is theistic evolution. And so the, the reason for evil and the character of God are, are intricate factors here in our choice uh, between these two. <coughs> well, okay, so if theistic evolutionists say, uh, you know, they want to accept this scenario and they want to accept the Bible, then we can ask them, how do they explain evil then? What is their explanation? Well, there are basically three explanations given. Um, for, for those of us who take the Bible seriously, God is good, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing. If we want to accept theistic evolution, we have to give up at least one of those. So this, this, the explanations given by theistic evolutionists, um, one, God is not good, he really doesn't care, he's, you know, whatever happens. Or maybe he's good, but he's not able to create, he doesn't know how to do that. He only knows how to create through evolution. So he has limited ability. The third one, and there are some Adventists who promote this one, that uh, he used evolution, but God doesn't know the future. So he didn't know all the evil that evolution would bring. And so since he didn't know it was going to be this bad, you can't blame him for it. Okay, that's another, another explanation. And let me summarize those fairly bluntly. Um, if ev theistic evolution is true, God is cruel, he isn't very powerful, or he isn't very smart. And all, all those are, are tragic caricatures of the God of the Bible. <coughs> there is one other explanation for evil. Great controversy, Satan rebels, God creates peaceful, sinless world, Adam and Eve sin, and that brings evil into this world. Jesus brings redemption and heaven will correct the whole problem. So this is the only one really that makes any sense. These come about because of a previous choice to, to accept evolution and adjust one's theology accordingly. So <clears throat> we have kind of three scenarios. Now you got atheistic evolution and God created in seven days. Now most, most Christians are not going to fall for this one. So there needed to be something a little more clever in between. And that's where theistic evolution comes in, as I see it. <coughs> We're told that in the last days, um, the only those who will make it through who have filled their minds with the, the truths of the Bible. And that in the last days, truth will lie so close to, to, to error, that it will be difficult to tell apart um, except by the Bible. <coughs> and it's certainly going that way. The way this is explained sometimes and the way, this, the, way the Bible is explained, it, it's really puzzling unless you really know the Bible. So this is the, the one that um, is in, in between. And I, <coughs> and I will predict that in, the, in really get into end times, it will not be a battle between atheism and Christianity, atheism and the Bible. Atheism is already losing credibility. Uh, and when the devil comes down here doing miracles, Atheism is dead. <coughs> the contest will be between a truly believing the Bible and sort of a soft creation, creationism. Um, we could spend several hours on this one. I'm just going to briefly go over it. Why? Okay, so we, it's a question of evolution or creation, but why does time, why does geologic time make any difference? Why do we even care? Well, it matters because you got this fossil record, which is one layer of, of sediment after another, generally washed in by water, one layer after another. And so this is a history book, no matter if one puts a little time or lots of time in it. Um, it's a series of events, a history book. And if sin and evil came in at the beginning, uh, okay, then why don't we, find, don't we find any humans here? Why are humans at the end only 
human fossils and not at the beginning? This is to, the answer to this question is why geological time matters. <coughs> there, there are some answers we can give. Uh, you, if the uh, flood started and, and the, these first deposits, those are generally marine kind of animals. You wouldn't expect to find humans mixed in with the, with the trilobites. So there are some, some ways to look at it. We won't try to go into those today. But there's still the question, why are humans only up here and not at the beginning? Whereas in a truly uh, conservative biblical view, all of this had to have occurred after sin. <coughs> well, um, I I'll, I'll guess I'll spend a couple of minutes to go through a little, a little scenario here, an analogy. Uh, say you, water brings a layer of mud into your backyard. And you don't have a chance to clean it up, and so it happens several times. It happens five different times. You've got five layers of mud back there. That's, again, uh, a series of events, a little history book. And it, it's, a, it's a very small sample of what happened here. Same kind of thing. Well, you dig through these layers, finally you find some time, and you see some apricots in the first layer, but not in the others. Um, you see other interesting things, but particularly in the fifth layer, you find some doggy poop, which you trace by DNA uh, you know, down up to a neighbor's dog about three houses down the street. So we can describe the scenario. It must be that there was some apricot trees or one apricot tree here which got destroyed, and so you don't have any more apricots. But Lassie must not have been there until the fifth flood. And the, the evidence is pretty strong. Um, but we have one advantage here which we do not have in studying this. And that is over here, the people live there all the time. They know what happened, and they know when Lassie came. And they know that, in fact, there was an apricot tree which got uprooted and destroyed in the first flood. Okay, so far, so good. But we also know that Lassie was, was here uh, long before the, it, even the first flood happened. So what went wrong? Why did our data lead us, mislead us so badly? Well, we do a little digging, and uh, the neighbors get suspicious, but we figure out that an interesting fact, and that is, the fifth flood took a little different route, and it was the only one that went through Lassie's yard. Okay, so Lassie was there all the time, but you did not have the right conditions to preserve the evidence. Um, you have the same thing, there was, there's a, a type of, of fish, a coelacanth fish, which was believed to have been extinct six, 65 million years ago. It was not, it's not found in the Cenozoic fossil record, this upper part. Extinct, 65 million years ago. But in, but in 1939, they found living ones in the deep ocean uh, in Asia. <coughs> okay, so you, had, you did not have the right conditions to fossilize that fish for 65, supposedly 65 million years. And so um, other situations can be the same. Uh, in the ocean, we would not expect to find people, um, for instance. So there can be circumstances where certain animals are living, but you don't have the right conditions to fossilize them. And that pretty much has to be the case uh, if the Bible is in fact true, which I believe it is. That uh, for some reason, all through this, um, you did not have the right conditions to preserve these animals that are so familiar to us, including ourselves. <coughs> Just. For one example, to throw out, animals living in upland areas generally don't get fossilized. So there are, there are conditions that, that could um, bring this result. So <coughs> the Bible indicates a short time. And so science is correct about a lot of things. We, we, we love science. It's a very great way to find truth. But if the Bible is correct, science is clearly wrong about some things. It doesn't understand. Uh, this false fossil record. And the idea that you could have the, not have the right conditions to preserve humans is much far more likely in a, in a very catastrophic rapid process than in millions of years of uh, scenario. So humans and other life forms had to be living where fossils are not forming. Creation and human origin were at the beginning of the fossil record. Um, a lot of people will find that very hard to accept, but that pretty much has to be the answer. We, I will predict, with more evidence, we'll find out that this is the way it was. Even though we don't know, we don't have enough evidence now. 
So <clears throat> millions of years you have theistic evolution or atheistic. The Bible is not true. God is the author of evil because it, it involves evolution over all that time. If it's thousands of years, you have a literal creation. The Bible record is true. Sin is a cause of evil. So time is intricately involved in our choice here. <clears throat> the, way, the way culture uh, today understands truth, in, in quotes, there are two levels of this truth, in quotes, uh, of, of understanding. Religion, in this view, gives personal, subjective values, emotions. It's kind of the world of the heart. Whereas science is public, neutral, objective, reliable facts, the world of the mind. I've heard an Adventist theologian can make this comparison. Science has facts, religion has assumptions. But there is no such thing as, as uh, neutral science. There simply is no such thing. Every scientist, every human being has a world view, whether they realize it or not. And scientists generally don't study philosophy, and they don't Think about this, <coughs> but there, this, this, art of this division here is not real. Uh, science is not the, the, the world of the mind, religion, the world of the heart. We all deal with mind and heart in, in the things that we think about. <coughs> so we can compare some worldviews. Christian worldview, you have eternal God of love, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. The secular, Darwinian worldview, matter and energy, purposeless, evolution of all creatures, progress, annihilation. <coughs> okay, so that's a pretty stark contrast. Um, too stark, so, so this modification is made. You have literal creation, and now we, we, we take the secular worldview and just stick a little bit of religion in here and there and come up with theistic evolution. God sort of vaguely involved Origin is still by mutation and natural selection. The same way, this is all the same in, in theistic or atheist, in atheistic or theistic evolution. Um, heaven, well, who knows. And now let's look at, <coughs> um, I'm concluding at this point now that, that it really does matter what we think uh, about creation. Now, how does that relate to the final conflict is my second main point. Um, in October 44, 1844, we're aware of how some end time prophecies relate to 1844. It's the beginning of what the Bible refers to as the time of the end. <coughs> and we understand what happened in October 1844. Um, but there's some, it's the end, it's the beginning of these end time prophecies, but there's some other things that happened in 1844. For one thing, Charles Darwin wrote the first description of his theory of evolution. He didn't publish it at that time, but he wrote it up in 1844. Also in 1844, in October of 1844, a book was published, Vestiges of the Natural History of the Creation by Robert Chambers. Now he didn't have a, th a mechanism for evolution like Darwin did, but it was a fully evolutionary scenario for life and it's, it's credited as being the, the most significant influence preparing the way for acceptance of Darwin's theory. So that, that happened in 1844, October 1844. So <coughs> we begin the end time part of the of world's history and the devil introduces his counterattack. He knows that if he can reduce confidence in God as creator, it will have a very great um, impact in undermining Christianity. Then we come to some last day instructions. Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. When you have angels shouting with a loud voice in the heavens, we probably should listen. Um, and of course, it brings in um, uh, creation. God, worship the God who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So it's bringing us back to worshiping the creator. And we look at what's happening around the, on us in the world today, it's clear that we need uh, that reminder. <clears throat> so in the last days, creation is important. Why? Because we're, we're, we're facing the choice between the God who loves us and something very different. Does creation matter? Yes, I would say it matters a great deal. Um, and this is what's happening in the Christian world, the great divide, and this is very rapidly occurring. 
The church is dividing into these two different camps. Human reasoning is, is sufficient. Science is our standard. Theistic evolution and uh, who knows about the Sabbath. Trust in our God, Bible is our standard, literal creation is seventh day Sabbath. So two, two major camps uh, and Christianity is rapidly dividing into those two. <coughs> so um, my conclusion, our conclusion in this little book is that it does matter and it, it summarizes these, these factors. Um, it also talks, this is not primarily a science book, but the last part of it gives us a little summary of the trends in science, and so I'm going to go over those a bit this morning. Um, when Darwin wrote his book, he and his colleagues knew essentially nothing about the complexity of life. Um, molecular biology was decades in the future, uh, even genetics, they had, uh, they had no idea what mutations were. Uh, life to, to Darwin and his colleagues was a little bit of jello and in, a, in a membrane with a few things floating in it. Could easily evolve. You know, it was easy to think that way. Um, 20th century, we know that life is a lot more complex. That Darwin and his friends had no idea what it was all about. But still, science became more and more confident that um, that evolution was a correct explanation. <coughs> uh, there were experiments in the, in the 1950s which they thought showed how life, how initial life spark could begin. Uh, Miller and Urey's experiments. Uh, they, f they discovered what DNA was and how it works all oh, a little. Now we know what, what made it, um, what controls life, and pretty soon the creator will be just not needed. <coughs> but it was still becoming evident life is very complex. And as time went on, it was realized that those early uh, origin of life experiments were not realistic. And, and the more we learn about molecular biology, the more completely unrealistic it is to think that life could begin by itself. So we have, dimini we have cracks appearing in the scenario, in the naturalistic scenario. The naturalism being the belief that there's, there's never been any supernatural. Uh, for decades, it has been believed that most DNA is junk. You've heard the term junk DNA. Uh, humans were considered to be uh, 98, our DNA is 98% junk, 2% um, what's called coding genes. A coding gene is a gene that describes how to make a protein. Okay, so we got 2% describes how to make proteins, 98% is leftover junk from evolution. <coughs> um, that was believed for a long time, and it was thought to be sort of a, key, a, a keystone in evolution theory. Uh, you have all this junk left over, and that's where mutations can occur to make new genes. Well, um, as early as, well, in the 1970s, when I first started teaching here, I remember some of my molecular biology colony, colleagues predicting that, that we'll find that that's not junk DNA. That just isn't, can't be true. You have a very intelligent creator. Why would he have junk? in there. And actually, um, I'll give you a little analogy <coughs> for, for the DNA. Coding genes are instructions to tell how to make proteins, okay, little protein factories, so to speak. The rest of it is, is nothing. Well, think of an of a, of automobile factory. <coughs> You've got machines that make quarter-inch bolts. You got another machine that makes uh, bigger bolts. You got a machine that makes pistons. <coughs> you got a machine that makes fenders. And that's what you've got. Okay, at the end of the year, what are you going to have? Big pile of bolts, another pile of another bolts, the pile of fenders, pile of uh, you know whatever else. Uh, how is it going to put everything together? You have to have a massive control system to tell exactly when, how much, how many of these bolts to make, where to make them. How to put them together with some other part? You have to have a, just an enormous, sophisticated control system. And think about then uh, a living cell. You've got coding genes that make proteins, little protein machines. Okay, if that's all you've got, what are you going to have? You're going to have a pile of protein here, another pile of some other protein. You need a, a massive control system 
to tell where and when to make each of these proteins, how much, how to fit them together with some other protein. Um, and if all you've got is coding genes and junk, where is your control system? This whole idea of junk DNA has always been a very, very naive idea. Um, <coughs> and as I see it, it, it only survived because in the evolution theory, you expect a lot of junk to be produced. But in recent years, there's been more and more question about this junk DNA. More and more of these genes were found to be control genes, just as we, as we would think they would be needed. And just last September, uh, the ENCODE project came to a point where it published 30 papers. ENCODE is a massive genome study financed by huge amounts of government funds, analyzing all different parts of the human genome. And their, their finding was that of the 80% of our genes that they had studied so far, it was all functional. And they expect that the other 20% is going to be functional as well. So junk DNA is no longer a useful concept. <coughs> so we've got more and more cracks appearing in, in these, this scenario. In 1992, an Adventist physician, Gary Gilbert, published a, a paper in uh, Spectrum on a certain pseudogene. Pseudogene is a gene that's like a functional gene, but it has a lot of changes, a lot of what's assumed to be mutations, so it's non-functional. And he described this, this pseudogene in humans and chimps, which has the same mutations. Thus, those mutations had to have happened before humans and chimps divided. OK, so what do we do with that? <coughs> well, I would tell you the best thing to do in those situations is just wait and see what happens. And, and that, in fact, turned out to be right. Because in the last couple of years, uh, evidence has shown that those specific pseudogenes are not pseudogenes. They, they are control genes in, in the, the globin sequence of genes, uh, the globin proteins. Uh, and so not only are they not pseudogenes, but they are essential. Even one mutation in, in this pseudogene causes uh, abnormalities in humans. So Gary Gilbert was basing his claim on ignorance because we didn't know what this gene did. Now we know. And now we know that he was completely wrong. It's a, it's a very functional gene. And this is happening over and over again. More and more cracks are appearing in the naturalistic scenario. OK, look, look at the whole idea of Darwinian evolution. <coughs> the idea that life and all these life forms can develop by random mutations and natural selection. That has thought, been thought for the last 150 years to be the powerful mechanism that can produce all life forms. Um, random mutation and natural selection. Natural selection does not make things. It cannot see the future. It cannot see what's needed. All it can do is choose between two alternatives or more that were there at a given moment in time. That's all it can do. So where do those things come from that it chooses from? This is the big question. And more and more scientists today are, are realizing that, yeah, random mutations and natural action happens, but what can it do? It can make a very, very limited amount of change. <coughs> um, now, keep, now, keep in mind, Darwinian evolution is still textbook orthodoxy. That's what's taught everywhere. But there are a few scientists who are brave enough to speak up. They get roundly criticized. But they're realizing that it, this doesn't work. <coughs> One of the best sources that I found is a book by an eminent evolutionist, uh, James Shapiro. It's called Evolution, A View from the 21st Century. And he's a molecular biologist. And he's pointing out that molecular biology in recent decades has been discovering things that most evolutionary scientists are ignoring. Now, he's an evolutionary scientist. He, he affirms his belief that life came about by evolution. But he's being honest. He's realizing what we know now that we didn't know before that molecular biology <coughs> is, is revealing amazing things. Uh, it used to be thought that you have DNA. The DNA gives instructions that tells what to do. There's no return information. It's a one-way process, and random mutations occur, and then that changes the organism. Now we know that each cell has lots of sensors. It senses the environment of the cell. And those sensors give information 
to the genes and, and other, to all the mechanism in the cell, and it actually decides how to interpret the DNA. You can have organisms that are different, but their DNA is not different. The, these sensors are, are determining how to use that information. And they do what he calls uh, natural genetic engineering. <coughs> and he says, in, this, in what we know now, there simply is no room in there for, for random mutations. It doesn't work. Uh, so uh, how does he explain evolution? Well, he simply says, we, how this all evolved is a mystery. We have no idea. Um, so he believes it evolved, but he's realizing we really don't know anything about how it works or how it got that way. <coughs> and so cracks are getting wider and more menacing to the naturalistic uh, theory. Even though you will not know that from watching TV or reading the textbooks, most publications. <coughs> and yet, um, if you really dig into it, it's clear that these things are in serious problem. Okay, what about geology? Geology is more of a challenge for a good reason. Biology is a study of things, processes that are happening right now. We can study them in our laboratory and understand more and more about how they work. Geology is about the past. We weren't there. We can study processes that happen today in rivers and, and streams and uh, lakes. But we have no modern analog of a global flood. All of, our, all of the analogs we use today, the, these river processes and others, those are on a small uh, local scale, basically. Uh, and so it's much harder to understand geology. <coughs> um, radiometric time scale, the, the, the dating processes, I don't know how to explain those. I don't think any of us do. So those are unanswered questions. But there are, uh, there are other things. There are unanswered questions, but there are types of geological evidences which are not compatible with that deep time, millions of years. Uh, they're just very hard to explain if there was so much time. And if we had another three hours, I could give you some good examples. But there are, there are things we see in geology, if you study them carefully, um, they don't fit with long time. It's very hard to explain by long time. Just give you one. <coughs> um, we have all this sediment out there in the rocks. There's a lot of sediment. But yet, for, for 500 million years since the Cambrian, um, there's not nearly enough sediment to account for that time. Uh, you, can, you can study deposits. For instance, um, some papers on, a, on three sandstone deposits in Russia are, are a good example. Um, they can study the, you can study these sandstones and you can look at the grain sizes and the structures in there and you can tell how much energy there had to be to deposit that. In other words, how fast did it have to be deposited? And the evidence is that it must have been deposited in like uh, one-tenth of a percent of the amount of time that the radiometric dates would give you. And this is not, and that, that's not an isolated example. That's generally the case in the rocks. There is not nearly enough rock to account for the time. Okay, other geologists know this. So how, do, how do they deal with it? Well, there's a theory they have that um, you must have had a lot of sediment deposited by water, and then most of it gets eroded away. And then you deposit a whole lot more, then most of it gets eroded away and so on, and so it goes. <coughs> okay, does the evidence indicate that? Well, there are, there are um, what we call erosional unconformities. These, these geologists know that. But after those known unconformities are accounted for, then you still have this problem of an enormous amount of sediment less than what you need. Okay, so the explanation is, is not based on evidence, it's based on the assumption of time. It's an ad hoc um, theory to, to make the data fit uh, the long time. And so there are things like this in science that you won't read about in the science books, um, but they are there if you, if you study them carefully. <coughs> and you, you understand how they're coming to conclusions, you can realize that it's not really based on evidence, it's based on their assumptions of long time. Um, Geology for 100 years would not accept any catastrophes. 
Then a, 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 an independent thinking geologist named uh, J. Harlan Bretz, I actually made up that name, that wasn't really his name, but he liked it. And so he, he, he discovered up in Washington State deposits that required catastrophic action. That kind of broke the stranglehold of, of um, the idea against being catastrophes. And so now geologists do recognize that catastrophes happen. But yet there's still a limit. You, you don't dare push your catastrophic explanations far enough to question deep time, millions of years. Uh, that won't be accepted. And so there still is a strong bias against recognizing that things may have happened very much faster. Okay, my conclusions, three main points. The spiritual issues are important. It does matter what we believe. There's a critical end time choice that we must make. And there are unanswered questions, but the evidence is actually trending in the right direction, the direction we would expect it to. And so I'd say, just like with Gary Gilbert's pseudogene, I would say, you got unanswered questions? Okay, fine, wait and see what's gonna be found later. Someday uh, in heaven, we'll, we'll find all the answers. Now, it's unrealistic to think that e we even will find them. <coughs> the gospel and relationships. And, and we, we have friends who have questions. It doesn't help to argue with them. Scientific facts won't convince them. You first need to become their friend until they reach a point where they trust you and are willing to start asking questions. Then be ready to answer the question. And that's the way we can most constructively deal with these. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for this very good presentation, Leonard. I, uh, very much appreciate your your firm stand. Uh, I would. You didn't have time, of course, and I'm sure you uh, want to give some time for discussion. So, uh, I would say, uh, as I've looked at that geological record, which uh, you say is more difficult than the biological record, and I agree fully a few reasons for it. Uh, it seems to me that there are. Uh, it's hard for me to go out there and look at those layers and relate it to our present topography. And I'm it is. speaking mainly of the topography here. Uh, you go out there and you look at those layers and they're so extensive and three days after you've been driving you still see the same layers. Uh, this is so out of character with what is going on now on the present on the continents that uh, you just can't put it together. Uh, widespread layers are, to me, uh, incomprehensible in terms of long ages processes and slow movement of continents and uplift and so on. Uh, uh, something very different happened there, and the, the way it looks is it fits so much better with the flood model than it does with those widespread layers. Mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, I would add the uh, the paraconformities, the gaps, mm -hmm. where you don't see uh, the erosion that should be there for millions of years. Uh, I would add uh, the residual carbon-14 picture that... Uh, uh, Paul has been working on here. Uh, uh, I mean, this this is a sort of challenge to to uh, to geology, and then, of course, you get into biology, then you get into dinosaurs and the soft tissue thing. But that, I'm just talking about the geology here. Uh, we're not without some good reason, mm -hmm. and our backs are not against the wall in geology. Yeah, I agree completely. And I, like he says, I didn't really take the time to go into that. But he's talking about these layers that go on for hundreds of miles. What happens today? Well, things get deposited in river valleys and in lakes, and a totally different picture. In the summer, our Chadwick and I will be following one of these paraconformities with a helicopter for all over Utah and and uh, studying the, the the there just isn't the evidence of of, a, of millions of years like there should be. I was wondering. Uh, there, there are two problems that seem to me to be rather uh, extensive. 
One is that there isn't enough deposit to justify all these millions of years. But the other one is that the rate of erosion is too high mm -hmm. to still leave all the deposit where it is. Um, and yet, if we assume that, as some of these arguments that you mentioned, that there have been numerous erosions before, uh, where the bulk of it has been eroded away, we have to then look at, well, where did it go? And uh, how about adding up the total amount of accumulated sediment all over the surface? Uh, does the total amount justify a, a certain rate or a certain amount of time or anything like that? Uh, it seems to me, from, from what I've heard and read so far, that the amount of deposit in the oceans is not sufficient to explain uh, these kinds of rationalizations. Uh, am I off base No, that's, that's exactly right. And there's one a pa interesting <coughs> paper discussing this fact that there's not um, there all these this missing time, which you can't see. This paper, this guy, the geologist, he was discussing a certain clay layer uh, in the area where he lived, and there was supposedly 15 million of t years of time missing in there. He said he, no matter how much he looked at this clay layer, he could not figure out where that 50 million years would fit. So yeah. it's a big problem that they have, that we don't have. With, with reference to your, uh, your question about um, is there not enough sediment in the ocean, uh, there's no question there's a problem there. Uh, average thickness of sediments in the ocean is about 300 meters. Average thickness of sediments on the continents, probably about 1,200 uh, meters. Uh, uh, it's much thicker on the continents than it is in the ocean, which is not what you'd expect over time. You'd expect the sediments to go from uh, the continents to the ocean. Well, uh, the standard answer for that, uh, and you see this in many uh, textbooks and so on, is that. Well, the ocean, the material in the ocean is absorbed at the trenches, or, you know, the plate tectonics movement, and it goes down there. Uh, several things that don't seem to agree very well that the sediments are quite thin at the trenches, uh, they're, they're heavy at the, at the base, uh, the, the deltas, you know, the deltas of our rivers, and so on. Uh, but calculations indicate that, uh, uh, assuming that. Uh, they do go down, what you see there, it does go down into the trenches. Uh, what goes down, you know, maybe uh, only about uh, 10 or at most 20 percent of the rate of sediment production by the rivers goes into the trenches. In other words, way too much is produced for what seems to be absorbed. Uh, many of your trench, you have trenches, and many of your trenches are not of the absorbing uh, the, the type that uh, absorbs sediments and so on. So uh, the, the picture doesn't hold. The explanation does not hold up. Uh, the data fits better with the flood model. You had a question here? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, actually you apologize for presenting something similar to your previous presentation. Actually, I think I could listen to you 10 times. <laughs> I won't be tired. Mm. I need all this information. Thank you very much. Mm. And thank you, Ariel, for the strong argument you presented this morning, which for the first time, it became so clear in my mind. The extents, the extents of the evidence. Mm. Now. I, you, you also mentioned that you did uh, probably present the same evidence at different uh, locations, non-Adventist audiences, mm -hmm. and they were not interested. Mm -hmm. How about our own schools? For example, La Sierra. Mm -hmm. Have you been invited to make a similar presentation mm -hmm. And if you were, what was the reaction? I'm curious. Well, I, actually, when, when last year was part of Loma Linda University, I was chair of the biology department for 17 years over there, and I watched a certain process among some of the faculty occur since the 1970s, which we see now. 
And since we, since my department, uh, when the two campuses split, divorced, you might say, uh, I've been over here, and they've never asked me to come back. So, and I'm not surprised. <coughs> yeah. On a recent geological field trip, we found ourselves in the Red Rock Stadium there outside Denver. Some nice dinosaur tracks in the neighborhood as well. Mm. We were told that the Rocky Mountain Range that uh, was just to the west of us was in fact the second Rocky Mountain Range and that there had been a previous Rocky Mountain Range that had uh, eroded away. Is there evidence of that erosion or are we just uh, postulating it because of the necessary time uh, we need to occupy? Okay, we need to keep in mind two separate issues here. One is a series of events. What came first? Well, the, were those events really, did they really occur? The other question is the amount of time. Those are really completely different. Uh, this geologic column, we can, we can look at evidence for, for relative time. Yeah, this is older than, than this. It, it was here longer. Uh, was it an hour longer or 10 million years longer? That's a whole different question. And as far as I know, there probably is evidence for the, that earlier erosion. And during a global flood, would you expect a lot of erosion? Yeah, you would. Our, our mountains right here, the San Bernardino Mountains, are some of the youngest mountains on Earth in terms of when in this sequence they came up. Um, and, um, and there is evidence that they were once higher, and then eroded down, then they came up again, and filled this valley where we are, with the one or two kilometer deep trench, they filled it with sediment that eroded off of them. Okay, so those are probably real events. The question is how long? Do, do we have reason to think they took millions of years? And, and um, you know, we don't know all the answers of that, but, but a lot of, but we don't have to accept those long time spans. There's many reasons not to. Yeah, so the, the, the earth has been, I mean, the, the, the flood was not just kind of a quiet rising of the water and then going down. There's been dramatic things happening uh, on, on this earth. I have another simplistic question. It seems to me that the earth is um, <laughs> of one age. Everything was here, the whole sphere. Whether you dig it up or bury it or whatever you do with it, why would you have different radiometric dating mm -hmm. or time for the same dirt? <laughs> okay, that's a question a lot of us would like the answer for. Um, the, these, uh, we don't know the answer yet, um, but the, these radiometric elements, isotopes, they change through time. Okay, and so when you, you take a rock and you put it in your machine, the, there is no machine that could be invented that could tell you a date in years. What it measures is the, the ratio of the one isotope and the one that it changed to. You measure those ratios. And those ratios do change as you go up. The question is, what, what is the cause? Do we really understand what it is that makes them change? If they were here for millions of years, they would change. They would give you the pattern. But if it was a short time, there must be something else that can change them. And we don't really understand that yet. Well, from recent experiments, that we do know that some things that have been thought about those radiometric elements are not right. Uh, it has been thought that each element has an inherent uh, rate of change. And that you can't change that. But there is evidence now that, that actually those, the speed, the rate of, of decay varies with the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, okay, now. Uh, I don't know all, I can't tell you all the physics of that, but what it does show us is that there are outside influences that affect those. If God was involved in this flood, would things that he did have, have changed those? And that's something we have to consider. Um, and I think it probably is, is true. Um, see, there's another point. I, I kind of forgot what I was going to say, but um, you had another point? Um, Okay, I'll come back to that. Uh, just, just to add to your, uh, your comment about uh, radiometric dating, to me, the strongest evidence against radiometric dating is the, the fact that the rates of sedimentation are completely out of kilter 
with radiometric dates. It's, it's impossible to relate these, these two things. Uh, the geologic literature accepts very much the fact that, uh, and this is a, one of these ideas that came forth in the, in the 70s and so on when they were working on, on some of the things. It's, it's not current to speak of, but it's very definitely there in the literature. It's in, it's in textbooks also that uh, you know our continents should erode away in 10 million years. Well, you cannot put that together, the fact that our whole geologic column is still out there. Uh, a geologic column uh, of two to three billion years, if rates of erosion should be flatten the continents in 10 million years. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't put that together. This is data that very much favors the biblical model yeah. uh, type thing. And I, and I would add to that, of course, my, my, my little uh, pet uh, bit of evidence and at these paraconformities, where are the great, great gaps? Uh, for instance, in the Grand Canyon, the whole Ordovician and Silurian is missing throughout the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And yet you can barely determine where that uh, gap is, even though there's supposed to be 100 million years there, mm -hmm. especially in the western Grand Canyon, uh, beautifully displayed. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is that, uh, mm -hmm. as I say, uh, from a scientific perspective, our backs are not against the wall on this. Yeah, that's true. There's one of the one of the ones that I am impressed with. Lines of evidence, also in addition to some of those um, dinosaurs by radiometric dates, lived 60 to you know what a couple hundred million years ago, and um, but they're finding protein and and DNA in in ancient creatures, not dinosaurs and other things, and you can study today how long it takes for those molecules to break down under normal conditions. And it takes thousands of years, maybe they could last a million, some of them. But it's simply, from everything that is known chemically, it, it is impossible that those could be around for millions of years. And yet there they are in, in these creatures. Um, and so what do they do, what do scientists do with it? Well, one approach is to say, well, I guess they, they can last much longer than we thought. But that goes directly against some very real evidence. Uh, one of the um, ladies who studies that, Mary Schweitzer, um, she, she's a, I've gotten to know her. She's a friend. She analyzed some of the data that I have. And she came here to Loma Linda and gave a talk once. In fact, she's a Christian. She also gave a talk <coughs> in a LLBN TV program, Faith at Work, about her, her mission outreach. But anyway, she studies these processes. And she believes in long ages, but she is some sort of a creationist. But she said one of her favorite, in quotes, responses of a reviewer to an article that she was publishing in the scientific journal was he says, I don't care what the, your evidence is, I don't believe it. Um, okay, so this doesn't sit well with, with radiometric time. It just, it just doesn't. Uh, but if, if a person truly is committed to the naturalistic point of view, there can be no miracles, there's no creation, there's no flood, what do you do? I mean, you have to just try to figure out some way to make it fit. Before we go on, I'll point out that it is now 11.30, and I know some of you have places that you need to be. But we'll continue questioning until uh, Dr. Brand gets tired of answering. <laughs> You mentioned uh, in your lecture that uh, Jesus came as a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, by coincidence, this week I was reading what uh, a very influential Adventist wrote about babies. His name is uh, Ken Paulson, evangelist. Mm -hmm. His argument is that babies, unborn babies, have no intrinsic right to life until they, have, they take the first breath. Now, that means that Dr. Gosnell didn't do anything wrong because it is safer to produce a, what you call a, to force the baby out of the womb mm -hmm. prematurely 
and then kill the baby. It's safer, much safer for the woman. But there's no complications because the physician can see what he is doing, and he uh, the, there's no uh, risk of puncturing the uterus or leaving some parts of the baby inside. And he presented this as evidence for what he was doing. Now, my question is, what is your thought about this? Because in La Sierra. They have a building in honor of the greatest, one of the greatest abortionists who graduated from Loma Linda back in 1964. And when he won... He was on, a classmate of mine. Was he? <laughs> okay, on one occasion, he was invited by a preacher, non-Adventist preacher, to his church. And he says, don't you feel guilty for killing babies by the thousands. He says, well, in a way, I wish the day will come when Roe vs. Wade will be overturned. But in the meantime, if I stop doing this, women will go elsewhere for the same service. So I might, might as well profit from the legality of abortion. And this reminds me of what Neil Wilson said one time publicly when he was asked this question. He said, well, women will seek an abortion regardless of what our hospitals do. So we might as well profit from this. And we, he said this back in 1970 or something like that, and of course, some of our hospitals began to profit by killing the unborn. What is your thought about this? I'm glad I'm not a physician. <laughs> uh, I, I have definite opinions, but I, it's not my field at all, so I just, <laughs> I, I'm not interested in doing that. I understand that Fossils can only be directly dated with carbon-14, but it doesn't go out all these millions of years. And when they say that the fossil is millions of years old, they're dating, I guess, the rocks that the rocks, they find yeah. it in. What kind of problems does that, how valid is that, and what kind of problems does that present? Well, <clears throat> it's the same as any other radiometric date. I mean, they, you got a fossil, with the rock sequence here, you got a fossil here. Like you say, you can't date the fossil with most of those methods. You have to date, you find a generally an, a, a volcanic ash, and you date that. And you assume the fossil is about the same age. And so uh, <coughs> exactly what process you use doesn't matter. It's just the, the, the real issue is why are these ratios like they are that seem to indicate long age? And we don't know the answer for that. but. Um, it doesn't matter whether you date the fossil or the rock next to it. The real question is, uh, what's, the, what's wrong with those radiometric dates that we're getting? I guess the part of the question is, perhaps the fossil washed in to the, maybe the rocks really are a lot older, mm -hmm. and then the, the fossil got washed mm -hmm. in. Okay, that, that, uh, that point is made sometimes, but the thing is, the, when you're looking at, when you're dating rocks that are, that are like the core of the earth, where well, there are no fossils, uh, I don't know how old those are. The, I don't think the Bible really talks about those. But when you're looking at this part of the fossil record that has life in it, um, then you can't really use that argument that the rocks are old and the fossils are young. Because you're, if, if, unless we're really wrong on what's going on here with the, making these dates, um, the rocks, what you're dating is the time when that rock formation got there, not how, how, what it was like down on the earth sometime earlier. Um, and so uh, the rocks show a sequence of ages along with the fossils that are next to them. And so whatever the process is, it has to be explained as something um, that was happening um, after creation. Now, there's, there's one one thing about this, I remember something I was going to say earlier. 
um, that, um, well, let's see. <laughs> I guess God doesn't want me to say this. I don't know. But, oh, I, I know. Okay, the, the, the rocks, those dating methods say it's very old. God says otherwise. Who do we think understands geology better? That, that's, that's the real issue. Yeah. Um, I understand you've done a little work in the Pisco Formation, and uh, there have been some radiometric dates on that, and uh, also some estimates as to uh, the time required to bury whales in that formation. Uh, would you care to comment on uh, some of that uh, data? Yeah, some colleagues and I studied this deposit in Peru. It has thousands of beautifully preserved whales. And these are big whales. <coughs> and um, the sediment that they're, for, that they're in is believed to have accumulated on the ocean floor, uh, you know, about maybe this much per thousand years. Okay, and that's the way it happens today in the oceans. This is mostly diatom skeletons and some sand. Um, okay, so you've got a whale that's this big in diameter. The sediment is accumulating this much per thousand years. Okay, what it's going to take? 10,000 years to bury a whale? Well, when you study whales today, when they die and fall in the ocean, um, the, the creatures there, the invertebrates, eat the flesh, the whale's flesh, in maybe six months, and a few years the whale is gone. The whale and other skeletons simply don't lie around for long periods of time. So there's a problem there. That formation is thought to be have taken about 12 million years. And if you, you know, if you calculate how much sediment per year, it just doesn't work. The whales obviously were buried very rapidly. Um, and so there you have a conflict between the evidence that you see and the, um, and the time. Of course, you know, these things we don't make proof. Science doesn't really prove things in the normal sense of the term. Because somebody can always say, well, yeah, I mean, this, this is positive very fast, but then there must have been a time break when nothing much was happening for five million years. And you, know, you can't prove it's wrong, but it, it doesn't really fit very well. Maybe you can make a, another comment about, um, uh, well, uh, bioturbation. Hmm. Okay, this, this goes along with some things that Ariel was talking about. When you look at you know, all these layers of sediment, they were deposited by water. And for instance, you look what happens when layers of mud and things get deposited in the shallow ocean, offshore and other places and lakes. There are, there are unknown numbers of little creatures that are burrowing through that. And, uh, and they, they churn up the sediments, and very quickly they destroy any layering that's there. Okay, so if these layers of sediment out there in the rocks, if they, if they were made under those conditions, very slow, gradual conditions, there should be no layers detectable. Why can we still DC detail, see these layers and follow them for long distances? And you really don't find much in the way of these worm burrows and things. You find some, yeah, there definitely is there but not nearly enough to destroy these layers. And so that's a problem for, it goes against long time. I see circular thinking here. I see they've, the, uh, the, we know the age of the fossils because of the age of the rocks they're in, and we know the age of the rocks because of the kind of fossils that we find they're in. If the fossil is 200 million years old, the rocks around it are 200 million years old. <clears throat> okay, let me defend the logic of those who do this. I'm not defending their conclusions, but, but their logic. You find there, there are a number of places around the world where you do have a pretty good sampling of this geologic column. You know, right up here in Utah is one. You have Cambrian and you have you know, different. And, um, and you find the fossils. You find invertebrates at the bottom. You don't find mammals until way up high, et cetera. So wherever you look, you do find this sequence. And then you check it out with radiometric dates <coughs> and you, you give dates to it. Okay, uh, and so, you, so then you go to another location, you only have maybe just the Mesozoic part where the dinosaurs are. And then you, you, but then you decide, okay, these fossils must be the same age as these dinosaurs over here. So the logic they are using is okay. 
uh, if their assumption about time is right, then, then it's okay. But what, what we disagree with is the time. There is, there is a, um, generally a reliable sequence. You don't find any humans at the bottom. But we simply totally disagree with the time involved. Just, just this a further comment about bioturbation. Uh, it was my privilege uh, at the invitation of uh, National Oceanic Administer Administration to go to the Bahamas and live in one of their underwater habitats for a week. Uh, incidentally, uh, we kept Sabbath while we were there and uh, one of the questions that came up is, uh, what if Christ came while we were underwater there? Would we know about it? <laughs> uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, uh, one night when I was, we were in this habitat, it, it, uh, it's um, about 18 feet long and 9 feet in diameter, and there were three of us living in it for a week. Uh, there was a bad, very bad storm, and uh, the habitat was shaking back and forth and so on. Uh, we were only 50 feet down, and so we were then um, uh, wave uh, activity. Uh, but the next morning, we looked out there, and all the sand around there had beautiful ripple marks on it. Now, the thing that surprised me is that two days later, you couldn't find them. Uh, this stuff doesn't last that long under those conditions. Now, you need to be careful to not apply that to where such can, but man, the parrotfish around there and the crabs growing over that stuff, it completely destroyed those, those, those ripple marks in just that very short time. Interesting. I remember him down there. He was down in this chamber under the ocean. Um, and a student was, was up at the surface making sure all the right supplies and everything got down. And the student was a person who had a really hard time getting along with the other people. And I wondered, you know, do I really want my life in his hands? But uh, he survived okay. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned about relationships. What's really important is relationships, and I have to go here pretty quick. But we have a lot of opportunities to get to know people who, in the scientific community, um, who are anti-creationists. Uh, but those of us here in my department, we're doing research, we, collab we collaborate, we're friends of these people. And when they get to know us and see that we do good science, uh, a lot of their jokes about creation stop. I mean, they, they still don't agree with us, but, but they learn, can learn to um, respect us. And so, um, you know, that's an important part of what we do. We don't argue with these guys and put them down. You get to know them, and they, they, their thinking begins to change a little bit. And we can keep praying for those people. Okay, I do need to go. So uh, thank you for your time.